Ellis Vygotsky, Thought and Language, Chapter 6, The Development of Scientific Concepts in Childhood, Part 1. To devise successful methods of instructing the school child in systematic knowledge, it is necessary to understand the development of scientific concepts in the child's mind. No less important than this practical aspect of the problem is its theoretical significance for psychological science, yet our knowledge of the entire subject is surprisingly scanty. What happens in the mind of the child to the scientific concepts he is taught at school? What is the relationship between the assimilating of information and the internal development of a scientific concept in the child's consciousness? Contemporary child psychology has two answers to these questions. One school of thought believes that scientific concepts have no inward history, i.e. do not undergo development, but are absorbed ready-made through a process of understanding and assimilation. Most educational theories and methods are still based on this view. It is nevertheless a view that fails to stand up under scrutiny either theoretically or in its practical applications. As we know from investigations of the process of concept formation, a concept is more than the sum of certain associative bonds formed by memory, more than a mere mental habit. It is a complex and genuine act of thought that cannot be taught by drilling, but can be accomplished only when the child's mental development itself has reached the requisite level. At any age, a concept embodied in a word represents an act of generalization. But word meanings evolve. When a new word has been learned by the child, its development is barely starting. The word at first is a generalization of the most primitive type. As the child's intellect develops, it is replaced by generalizations of a higher and higher type, a process that leads in the end to the formation of true concepts. The development of concepts, or word meanings, presupposes the development of many intellectual functions, deliberate attention, logical memory, abstraction, the ability to compare and to differentiate. These complex psychological processes cannot be mastered through the initial learning alone. Practical experience also shows that direct teaching of concepts is impossible and fruitless. A teacher who tries to do this usually accomplishes nothing but empty verbalism, a parrot-like repetition of words by the child, simulating a knowledge of the corresponding concepts, but actually covering up a vacuum. Leo Tolstoy, with his profound understanding of the nature of word and meaning, realized more clearly than most other educators the impossibility of simply relaying a concept from teacher to pupil. He tells of his attempts to teach literary language to peasant children by first translating their own vocabulary into the language of folk tales, then translating the language of tales into literary Russian. He found that one could not teach children literary language by artificial explanations, compulsive memorizing and repetition, as one teaches a foreign language. Tolstoy writes, quote, we have to admit that we attempted several times to do this, and always met with an invincible distaste on the part of the children, which shows that we were on the wrong track. These experiments have left me with the certainty that it is quite impossible to explain the meaning of a word. When you explain any word, the word impression, for instance, you put in its place another equally incomprehensible word, or a whole series of words, with a connection between them as incomprehensible as the word itself. End quote. What the child needs, says Tolstoy, is a chance to acquire new concepts and words from the general linguistic context. Quote, when he has heard or read an unknown word in an otherwise comprehensible sentence, and another time in another sentence, he begins to have a hazy idea of the new concept. Sooner or later he will feel the need to use that word, and once he has used it, the word and the concept are his. But to give the pupil new concepts deliberately is, I am convinced, as impossible and futile as teaching a child to walk by the laws of equilibrium." End quote. The second conception of the evolution of scientific concepts does not deny the existence of a developmental process in the schoolchild's mind. 
It holds, however, that this process does not differ in any essential form the development of the concepts formed by the child in his everyday experience, and that it is pointless to consider the two processes separately. What is the basis for this view? The literature in this field shows that in studying concept formation in childhood, most investigators have used everyday concepts formed by children without systematic instruction. The laws based on these data are assumed to apply also to the child's scientific concepts, and no checking of this assumption is deemed necessary. Only a few of the more perspicacious modern students of child thought question the legitimacy of such an extension. Piaget draws a sharp line between the child's ideas of reality, developed mainly through his own mental efforts, and those that were decisively influenced by adults. He designates designates the first group as spontaneous, the second as non-spontaneous, and admits that the latter may deserve independent investigation. In this respect, he goes farther and deeper than any of the other students of children's concepts. At the same time, there are errors in Piaget's reasoning that detract from the value of his views. Although he holds that the child in forming a concept stamps it with the characteristics of his own mentality, Piaget tends to apply this thesis only to spontaneous concepts and assumes that they alone can truly enlighten us on the special qualities of child thought. He fails to see the interaction between the two kinds of concepts and the bonds that unite them into a total system of concepts in the course of the child's intellectual development. These errors lead to yet another. It is one of the basic tenets of Piaget's theory that progressive socialization of thinking is the very essence of the child's mental development. But if his views on the nature of non-spontaneous concepts were correct, it would follow that such an important factor in the socialization of thought as school learning is unrelated to the inner development processes. This inconsistency is the weak spot of Piaget's theory, both theoretically and practically. Theoretically, socialization of thought is seen by Piaget as a mechanical abolition of the characteristics of the child's own thought, their gradual withering away. All that is new in development comes from without, replacing the child's own modes of thought. Throughout childhood, there is a ceaseless conflict between the two mutually antagonistic forms of thinking with a series of compromises at each successive developmental level until adult thought wins out. The child's own nature plays no constructive part in his intellectual progress. When Piaget says that nothing is more important for effective teaching than a thorough knowledge of spontaneous child thought, he is apparently prompted by the idea that child thought must be known as any enemy must be known in order to be fought successfully. We shall counter these erroneous premises with the premise that the development of non-spontaneous concepts must possess all the traits peculiar to child thought at each developmental level, because these concepts are not simply acquired by rote, but evolve with the aid of strenuous mental activity on the part of the child himself. We believe that the two processes, the development of spontaneous and of non-spontaneous concepts, are related and constantly influence each other. They are parts of a single process, the development of concept formation, which is affected by varying external and internal conditions, but is essentially a unitary process, not a conflict of antagonistic, mutually exclusive forms of mentation. Instruction is one of the principal sources of the school child's concepts, and is also a powerful source in directing their evolution. It determines the fate of his total mental development. If so, the results of the psychological study of children's concepts can be applied to the problems of teaching in a manner very different from that envisioned by Piaget. Before discussing these premises in detail, we want to set forth our own reasons for differentiating between spontaneous and non-spontaneous, in particular scientific, concepts and for subjecting the latter to special study. First. We know from simple observation that concepts form and develop under entirely different inner and outer conditions, depending on whether they originate in classroom instruction or in the child's personal experience. Even the motives prompting the child to form the two kinds of concepts are not the same. The mind faces different problems when assimilating concepts at school 
and when left to its own devices. When we impart systematic knowledge to the child, we teach him many things that he cannot directly see or experience. Since scientific and spontaneous concepts differ in their relation to the child's experience and in the child's attitude toward their objects, they may be expected to follow differing developmental paths from their inception to their final form. The singling out of scientific concepts as an object of study also has a heuristic value. At present, psychology has only two ways of studying concept formation. One deals with the child's real concepts, but uses methods, such as verbal definition, that do not penetrate below the surface. The other permits incomparably deeper psychological analysis, but only through studying the formation of artificially devised experimental concepts. An urgent methodological problem confronting us is to find ways of studying real concepts in depth, to find a method that could utilize the results already obtained by the two methods used so far. The most promising approach to the problem would seem to be the study of scientific concepts which are real concepts, yet are formed under our eyes almost in the fashion of artificial concepts. Finally, the study of scientific concepts as such has important implications for education and instruction. Even though these concepts are not absorbed ready-made, instruction and learning play a leading role in their acquisition. To uncover the complex relationship between instruction and the development of scientific concepts is an important practical task. These were the considerations that guided us in separating scientific from everyday concepts and subjecting them to comparative study. To illustrate the kind of question we tried to answer, let us take the concept brother, a typical everyday concept which Piaget used so skillfully to establish a whole series of peculiarities of child thought, and compare it with the concept exploitation, to which the child is introduced in his social science classes. Is their development the same or is it different? Does exploitation merely repeat the developmental course of the brother? Or is it psychologically a concept of a different type? We submit that the two concepts must differ in their development as well as in their functioning and that these two variants of the process of concept formation must influence each other's evolution. Part 2 to study the relationship between the development of scientific and that of everyday concepts, we need a yardstick for comparing them. To construct a measuring device, we must know the typical characteristics of everyday concepts at school age and the direction of their development during that period. Piaget demonstrated that the school child's concepts are marked primarily by his lack of conscious awareness of relationships, though he handles relationships correctly in a spontaneous, unreflective way. Piaget asked seven to eight-year-olds the meaning of the word because in the sentence, I won't go to school tomorrow because I am sick. Most of the children answered, it means that he is sick. Others said, it means that he won't go to school. A child is unable to realize that the question does not refer to the separate facts of sickness and of school absence, but to their connection. Yet he certainly grasps the meaning of the sentence. Spontaneously, he uses because correctly, but he does not know how to use it deliberately. Thus, he cannot supply a correct ending to the sentence, the man fell off his bicycle because. Often he will substitute a consequence, because he broke his arm, for the cause. Child thought is non-deliberate and unconscious of itself. How then does the child eventually reach awareness and mastery of his own thoughts? To explain the process, Piaget cites two psychological laws. One is the law of awareness, formulated by Claparède, approved by very interesting experiments that awareness of difference precedes awareness of likeness. The child quite naturally responds in similar ways to objects that are alike and has no need to become aware of his mode of response, while dissimilarity creates a state of maladaptation which leads to awareness. Claparade's law states that the more smoothly we use a relationship in action, the less conscious we are of it. We become aware of what we are doing in proportion to the difficulty we experience in adapting to a situation. Piaget uses Claparade's law to explain the development of thinking 
that takes place between the seventh and the twelfth year. During that period, the child's mental operations repeatedly come in conflict with adult thinking. He suffers failures and defeats because of the deficiencies of his logic, and these painful experiences create the need to become aware of his concepts. Realizing that need is not a sufficient explanation for any developmental change, Piaget supplements Claparate's law by the law of shift or displacement. To become conscious of a mental operation means to transfer it from the plane of action to that of language, i.e., to recreate it in the imagination so that it can be expressed in words. This change is neither quick nor smooth. The law states that mastering an operation on the higher plane of verbal thought presents the same difficulties as the earlier mastering of that operation on the plane of action. This accounts for the slow progress. These interpretations do not appear adequate. Clapper Reed's findings may have a different explanation. Our own experimental study suggests that the child becomes aware of differences earlier than of likenesses, not because differences lead to malfunctioning, but because awareness of similarity requires a more advanced structure of generalization and conceptualization than awareness of dissimilarity. In analyzing the development of concepts of difference and likeness, we found that consciousness of likeness presupposes the formation of a generalization or of a concept embracing the objects that are alike. Consciousness of difference requires no such generalization. It may come about in other ways. The fact that the developmental sequence of these two concepts reverses the sequence of the earlier behavioral handling of similarity and difference is not unique. Our experiments established, for instance, that the child responds to pictorially represented action earlier than to the representation of an object, but becomes fully conscious of the object earlier than of action. The law of shift is an example of the widespread genetic theory according to which certain events or patterns observed in the early stages of a developmental process will recur in its advanced stages. The traits that do recur often blind the observer to significant differences caused by the fact that the later processes take place on a higher developmental level. We can dispense with discussing the principle of repetition as such, since we are concerned merely with its explanatory value in respect to the growth of awareness. The law of shift, like the law of awareness, may at best answer the question of why the school child is not conscious of his concepts. It cannot explain how consciousness is achieved. We must look for another hypothesis to account for that decisive event in the child's mental development. According to Piaget, the school child's lack of awareness is a residue of his waning egocentrism, which still retains its influence in the sphere of verbal thought just beginning to form at that time. Consciousness is achieved when mature socialized thinking crowds out the residual egocentrism from the level of verbal thought. Such an explanation of the nature of the school child's concepts, based essentially on his general inability to become fully conscious of his acts, does not stand up in the face of facts. Various studies have shown that it is precisely during early school age that the higher intellectual functions, whose main features are reflective awareness and deliberate control, come to the fore in the developmental process. Attention, previously involuntary, becomes voluntary and increasingly dependent on the child's own thinking. Mechanical memory changes to logical memory guided by meaning and can now be deliberately used by the child. One might say that both attention and memory become logical and voluntary, since control of a function is the counterpart of one's consciousness of it. Nevertheless, the fact established by Piaget cannot be denied. The school child, though growing steadily in awareness and mastery, is not aware of his conceptual operations. All the basic mental functions become conscious and deliberate during school age, except intellect itself. To resolve this seeming paradox, we must turn to the basic laws governing psychological development. One of them is that consciousness and control appear only at a late stage in the development of a function, after it has been used and practiced unconsciously and spontaneously. In order to subject a function to intellectual and volitional control, we must first possess it. 
The stage of undifferentiated functions in infancy is followed by the differentiation and development of perception in early childhood and the development of memory in the preschooler, to mention only the outstanding aspects of mental development at each age. Attention, which is a correlate of the structuring of what is perceived and remembered, participates in this development. Consequently, the child about to enter school possesses in a fairly mature form the functions he must next learn to subject to conscious control. But concepts, or rather pre-concepts as they should be called at that stage, are barely beginning to evolve from complexes at that time, and it would indeed be a miracle if the child were able to become conscious of them and to govern them during the same period. For this to be possible, consciousness would not merely have to take possession of its single functions, but to create them. Before continuing, we want to clarify the term consciousness as we use it in speaking of non-conscious functions becoming conscious. We use the term non-conscious to distinguish what is not yet conscious from the Freudian unconscious resulting from repression, which is a late development, an effect of a relatively high differentiation of consciousness. The activity of consciousness can take different directions. It may illumine only a few aspects of a thought or an act. I've just tied a knot. I've done so consciously, yet I cannot explain how I did it, because my awareness was centered on the knot rather than on my own motions, the how of my action. When the latter becomes the object of my awareness, I shall have become fully conscious. We use consciousness to denote awareness of the activity of the mind, the consciousness of being conscious. A preschool child who, in response to the question, do you know your name? Tells his name, lacks this self-reflective awareness. He knows his name, but is not conscious of knowing it. Piaget's studies showed that introspection begins to develop only during the school years. This process has a good deal in common with the development of external perception and observation in the transition from infancy to early childhood, when the child passes from primitive wordless perception to perception of objects guided by and expressed in words, perception in terms of meaning. Similarly, the schoolchild passes from unformulated to verbalized introspection. He perceives his own psychic processes as meaningful, but perception in terms of meaning always implies a degree of generalization. Consequently, the transition to verbalized self-observation denotes a beginning process of generalization of the inner forms of activity. The shift to a new type of inner perception means also a shift to a higher type of inner activity, since a new way of seeing things opens up new possibilities for handling them. A chess player's moves are determined by what he sees on the board. When his perception of the game changes, his strategy will also change. In perceiving some of our own acts in a generalizing fashion, we isolate them from our total mental activity and are thus enabled to focus on this process as such and to enter into a new relationship to it. In this way, becoming conscious of our operations and viewing each as a process of a certain kind, such as remembering or imagining, leads to their mastery. School instruction induces the generalizing kind of perception and thus plays a decisive role in making the child conscious of his own mental processes. Scientific concepts with their hierarchical system of interrelationships seem to be the medium within which awareness and mastery first develop, to be transferred later to other concepts and other areas of thought. Reflective consciousness comes to the child through the portals of scientific concepts. Piaget's characterization of the child's spontaneous concepts as non-conscious and non-systematic tends to confirm our thesis. The implication that spontaneous, when applied to concepts, is a synonym of non-conscious is obvious throughout his writings, and the basis for this is easily seen. In operating with spontaneous concepts, the child is not conscious of them because his attention is always centered on the object to which the concept refers, never on the act of thought itself. Piaget's view that spontaneous concepts exist for the child outside any systematic context is equally clear. According to him, if we wish to discover and explore the child's own spontaneous idea 
hidden behind the non-spontaneous concept he voices, we must begin by freeing it from all ties to a system. This approach resulted in the kind of answers expressing the child's non-mediated attitude toward objects that fill all the books of Piaget. To us it seems obvious that a concept can become subject to consciousness and deliberate control only when it is a part of a system. If consciousness means generalization, generalization in turn means the formation of a superordinate concept that includes the given concept as a particular case. A superordinate concept implies the existence of a series of subordinate concepts, and it also presupposes a hierarchy of concepts of different levels of generality. Thus the given concept is placed within a system of relationships of generality. The following example may illustrate the function of varying degrees of generality in the emergence of a system. A child learns the word flower, and shortly afterwards the word rose. For a long time, the concept flower, though more widely applicable than rose, cannot be said to be more general for the child. It does not include and subordinate rose. The two are interchangeable and juxtaposed. When flower becomes generalized, the relationship of flower and rose, as well as of flower and other subordinate concepts, also changes in the child's mind. A system is taking shape. In the scientific concepts that the child acquires in school, the relationship to an object is mediated from the start by some other concept. Thus, the very notion of scientific concept implies a certain position in relation to other concepts, i.e. a place within a system of concepts. It is our contention that the rudiments of systematization first enter the child's mind by way of his contact with scientific concepts and are then transferred to everyday concepts, changing their psychological structure from the top down. Part 3. The interrelation of scientific and spontaneous concepts is a special case within a much broader subject, the relation of school instruction to the mental development of the child. Several theories concerning this relationship have, be have been advanced in the past, and the question remains one of the major preoccupations of Soviet psychology. We shall review three attempts to answer it, in order to place our own study within the broader context. The first and still most widely held theory considers instruction and development to be mutually independent. Development is seen as a process of maturation subject to natural laws, and instruction as the utilization of the opportunities created by development. Typical of this school of thought are its attempts to separate with great care the products of development from those of instruction, supposedly to find them in their pure form. No investigator has yet been able to achieve this. The blame is usually laid on inadequate methods, and the failures are compensated for by redoubled speculative analyses. These efforts to divide the child's intellectual equipment into two categories may go hand in hand with the notion that development can run its normal course and reach a high level without any assistance from instruction. That even children who never attend school can develop the highest forms of thinking accessible to human beings. More often, however, this theory is modified to take into account a relationship that obviously exists between development and instruction. The former creates the potentialities. The latter realizes them. Education is seen as a kind of superstructure erected over maturation, or, to change the metaphor, education is related to development as consumption to production. A one-sided relationship is thus conceded. Learning depends on development, but the course of development is not affected by learning. This theory rests on the simple observation that any instruction demands a certain degree of maturity of certain functions. One cannot teach a one-year-old to read or a three-year-old to write. The analysis of learning is thus reduced to determining the developmental level that various functions must reach for instruction to become feasible. When the child's memory has progressed enough to enable him to memorize the alphabet, when his attention can be held by a boring task, when his thinking has matured to the point where he can grasp the connection between sign and sound, then instruction in writing may begin. According to this variant of the first theory, 
instruction hobbles behind development. Development must complete certain cycles before instruction can begin. The truth of this last statement is obvious. A necessary minimum level does exist. Nevertheless, this one-sided view results in a series of misconceptions. Suppose the child's memory, attention, and thinking have developed to the point where he can be taught writing and arithmetic. Does the study of writing and arithmetic do anything to his memory, attention, and thinking, or does it not? Traditional psychology answers, yes, insofar as they exercise these conditions. But the process of development as such does not change. Nothing new happens in the mental growth of the child. He has learned to write, that is all. This view, characteristic of old-fashioned educational theory, also colors the writings of Piaget, who believes that the child's thinking goes through certain phases and stages regardless of any instruction he may receive. Instruction remains an extraneous factor. The gauge of the child's level of development is not what he has learned through instruction, but the manner in which he thinks on subjects about which he has been taught nothing. Here the separation, indeed the opposition, of instruction and development is carried to its extreme. The second theory concerning development and instruction identifies the two processes. Originally expounded by James, it bases both processes on association and habit formation, thus rendering instruction synonymous with development. This view enjoys a certain revival at present, with Thorndike as its chief protagonist. Reflexology, which has translated associationism into the language of physiology, sees the intellectual development of the child as a gradual accumulation of conditioned reflexes. And learning is viewed in exactly the same way. Since instruction and development are identical, no question of any concrete relationship between them can arise. The third school of thought, represented by Gestalt psychology, tries to reconcile the two foregoing theories while avoiding their pitfalls. Although this eclecticism results in a somewhat inconsistent approach, a certain synthesis of the two opposite views is achieved. Kafka states that all development has two aspects, maturation and learning. Although this means accepting in a less extreme form both of the older points of view, the new theory represents an improvement on the two others in three ways. First, Kafka admits some interdependence between the two aspects of development. On the basis of a number of facts, he demonstrates the maturation of an organ is contingent on its functioning, which improves through learning and practice. Maturation, in turn, provides new opportunities for learning. But Kafka merely postulates mutual influence without examining its nature in detail. Second, this theory introduces a new conception of the educational process itself as the formation of new structures and the perfecting of old ones. Instruction is thus accorded a meaningful structural role. A basic characteristic of any structure is its independence from its original substance. It can be transferred to other media. Once a child has formed a certain structure or learned a certain operation, he will be able to apply it in other areas. We have given him a penny worth of instruction, and he has gained a small fortune in development. The third point in which this theory compares favorably with the older ones is its view of the temporal relation between instruction and development. Since instruction given in one area can transform and reorganize other areas of child thought, it may not only follow maturing or keep in step with it, but also precede it and further its progress. The admission that different temporal sequences are equally possible and important is a contribution by the eclectic theory that should not be underestimated. This theory brings us face to face with an old issue reappearing in a new guise, the almost forgotten theory of formal discipline, usually associated with Herbart. It maintained that instruction in certain subjects develops the mental faculties in general, besides imparting the knowledge of the subject and specific skills. In practice, this led to the most reactionary forms of schooling, such as the Russian and the German classical gymnasiums, which inordinately stressed Greek and Latin as sources of formal discipline. The system was eventually discarded because it did not meet the practical aims of modern bourgeois education. Within psychology itself, Thorndike, in a series of investigations, did his best 
to discredit formal discipline as a myth and to prove that instruction had no far-reaching effects on development. His criticism is convincing insofar as it applies to the ludicrous exaggerations of the doctrine of formal discipline, but it does not touch its valuable kernel. In his effort to disprove Herbart's conception, Thorndike experimented with the narrowest, most specialized, and most elementary functions. From the point of view of a theory that reduces all learning to the formation of associative bonds, the choice of activity would make little difference. In some experiments, he gave his subjects practice in distinguishing between the relative lengths of lines, and then tried to establish whether this practice increased their ability to distinguish between sizes of angles. Naturally, he found that it did not. The influence of instruction on development has been postulated by the theory of formal discipline only in relation to such subjects as mathematics or languages, which involve vast complexes of psychic functions. The ability to gauge the length of lines may not affect the ability to distinguish between ang angles, but the study of the native language, with its attendant sharpening of concepts, may still have some bearing on the study of arithmetic. Thorndike's work merely makes it appear likely that there are two kinds of instruction. The narrowly specialized training in some skills such as typing, involving habit formation and exercise, and more often found in trade schools for adults, and the kind of instruction given school children, which activates large areas of consciousness. The idea of formal discipline may have little to do with the first kind, but may well prove to be valid for the second. It stands to reason that in the higher processes emerging during the cultural development of the child, formal discipline must play a role that it does not play in the more elementary processes. All the higher functions have in common awareness, abstraction, and control. In line with Thorndike's theoretical conceptions, the qualitative differences between the lower and the higher functions are ignored in his studies of the transfer of training. In formulating our own tentative theory of the relationship between instruction and development, we take our departure from four series of investigations. Their common purpose was to uncover these complex interrelations in certain definite areas of school instruction, reading and writing, grammar, arithmetic, natural science, and social science. The specific inquiries concerned such topics as the mastering of the decimal system in relation to the development of the concept of number, the child's awareness of his operations in solving mathematical problems, the processes of constructing and solving problems by first graders. Much interesting material came to light on the development of oral and written language during school age, the consecutive levels of understanding of figurative meaning, the influence of mastering grammatical structures on the course of mental development, the understanding of relationships and the study of social science and natural science. The investigations focused on the level of maturity of psychic functions at the beginning of schooling and the influence of schooling on the development, on the temporal sequence of instruction and development, on the formal disciplined function of the various subjects of instruction. We shall discuss these issues in succession. In our first series of studies, we examined the level of development of the psychic functions requisite for learning the basic school subjects reading and writing, arithmetic, natural science. We found that at the beginning of instruction, these functions could not be considered mature, even in the children who proved able to master their curriculum very successfully. Written language is a good illustration. Why does writing come so hard to the school child that at certain periods there is a lag of as much as six or eight years between his linguistic age in speaking and in writing? This used to be explained by the novelty of writing, as a new function, it must repeat the developmental stages of speech. Therefore, the writing of an eight-year-old must resemble the speech of a two-year-old. This explanation is patently insufficient. A two-year-old uses few words and a simple syntax because his vocabulary is small and his knowledge of more complex sentence structures non-existent. But the school child possesses the vocabulary and the grammatical forms for writing, since they are the same as for oral speech. Nor can the difficulties of mastering the mechanics of writing account for the tremendous lag between the school child's oral and written language. Our investigation has shown that the development of writing does not repeat 
the developmental history of speaking. Written speech is a separate linguistic function, differing from oral speech in both structure and mode of functioning. Even its minimal development requires a high level of abstraction. It is speech in thought and image only, lacking the musical, expressive, intonational qualities of oral speech. In learning to write, the child must disengage himself from the sensory aspect of speech and replace words by images of sounds, speech that is merely imagined and that requires symbolization of the sound image in written signs, i.e. a second degree of symbolization, naturally must be as much harder than oral speech for the child as algebra is harder than arithmetic. Our studies show that it is the abstract quality of written language that is the main stumbling block, not the underdevelopment of small muscles or any other mechanical obstacles. Writing is also speech without an interlocutor, addressed to an absent or an imaginary person or to no one in particular, a situation new and strange to the child. Our studies show that he has little motivation to learn writing when we begin to teach it. He feels no need for it and has only a vague idea of its usefulness. In conversation, every sentence is prompted by a motive. Desire or need lead to request, question to answer, bewilderment to explanation. The changing motives of the interlocutors determine at every moment the turn oral speech will take. It does not have to be considered, it does not have to be consciously directed. The dynamic situation takes care of that. The motives for writing are more abstract, more intellectualized, further removed from immediate needs. In written speech, we are obliged to create the situation, to represent it to ourselves. This demands detachment from the actual situation. Writing also requires deliberate analytical action on the part of the child. In speaking, he is hardly conscious of the sounds he pronounces and quite unconscious of the mental operations he performs. In writing, he must take cognizance of the sound structure of each word, dissect it and reproduce it in alphabetical symbols, which he must have studied and memorized before. In the same deliberate way, he must put words in a certain sequence to form a sentence. Written language demands conscious work because its relationship to inner speech is different from that of oral speech. The latter precedes inner speech in the course of development. While written speech follows inner speech and presupposes its existence, the act of writing implying a translation from inner speech. But the grammar of thought is not the same in the two cases. One might even say that the syntax of inner speech is the exact opposite of the syntax of written speech, with oral speech standing in the middle. Inner speech is condensed, abbreviated speech. Written speech is deployed to its fullest extent, more complete than oral speech. Inner speech is almost entirely predicative because the situation, the subject of thought, is always known to the thinker. Written speech, on the contrary, must explain the situation fully in order to be intelligible. The change from maximally compact inner speech to maximally detailed written speech requires what might be called deliberate semantics, deliberate structuring of the web of meaning. All these traits of written speech explain why its development in the child, in the school child, falls far behind that of oral speech. The discrepancy is caused by the child's proficiency in spontaneous, unconscious activity and his lack of skill in abstract, deliberate activity. As our study showed, the psychological functions on which written speech is based have not even begun to develop in the proper sense when instruction in writing starts. It must build on barely emerging, rudimentary processes. Similar results were obtained in the fields of arithmetic, grammar, and natural science. In every case, the requisite functions are immature when instruction begins. We shall briefly discuss the case of grammar, which presents some special features. Grammar is a subject which seems to be of little practical use. Unlike other school subjects, it does not give the child new skills. He conjugates and declines before he enters school. The opinion has even been voiced that school instruction and grammar could be dispensed with. We can, only reply that re we can only reply that our analysis clearly showed the study of grammar to be of paramount importance for the mental development of the child. The child does have a command of the grammar of his native tongue long before he enters school, 
but it is unconscious, acquired in a purely structural way, like the phonetic composition of words. If you ask a young child to produce a combination of sounds, for example, sk, you will find that its deliberate articulation is too hard for him, yet within a structure, as in the word Moscow, he pronounces the same sounds with ease. The same is true of grammar. The child will use the correct case or tense within a sentence, but cannot decline or conjugate a word on request. He may not acquire new grammatical or syntactic forms in school, but thanks to instruction in grammar and writing, he does become aware of what he is doing and learns to use his skills consciously. Just as the child realizes for the first time in learning to write that, this, that the word Moscow consists of the sounds M-O-S-K-O-W, Moscow, and learns to pronounce each one separately, he also learns to construct sentences to do consciously what he has been doing unconsciously in speaking. Grammar and writing help the child to rise to a higher level of speech development. Thus, our investigation shows that the development of the psychological foundations for instruction in basic subjects does not precede instruction but unfolds in a continuous interaction with the contributions of instruction. Number two, our second series of investigations centered on the temporal relation between the processes of instruction and the development of the corresponding psychological functions. We found that instruction usually precedes development. The child acquires certain habits and skills in a given area before he learns to apply them consciously and deliberately. There is never complete parallelism between the course of instruction and the development of the corresponding functions. Instruction has its own sequences and organization. It follows a curriculum and a timetable, tab time and its rules cannot be expected to coincide with the inner laws of the developmental processes it calls to life. On the basis of our studies, we tried to plot curves of the progress of instruction and of the participating psychological functions. Far from coinciding, these curves showed an exceedingly complex relationship. For example, the different steps in learning arithmetic may be of unequal value for mental development. It often happens that three or four steps in instruction add little to the child's understanding of arithmetic, and then with the fifth step, something clicks. The child has grasped a general principle, and his developmental curve rises markedly. For this particular child, the fifth operation was decisive, but this cannot be a general rule. The turning points at which a general principle becomes clear to the child cannot be set in advance by the curriculum. The child is not taught the decimal system as such. He is taught to write figures, to add and to multiply, to solve problems, and out of all this, some general concept of the decimal system eventually emerges. When the child learns some arithmetical, arithmetical operation or some scientific concept, the development of that operation or concept has only begun. Our study shows that the curve of development does not coincide with the curve of school instruction. By and large, instruction precedes development. Number three. Our third series of investigations resembles Thorndike's studies of the transfer of training, except that we experimented with subjects of school instruction and with the higher rather than the elementary functions, i.e. with subjects and functions which could be expected to be meaningfully related. We found that intellectual development, far from following Thorndike's atomistic model, is not compartmentalized according to topics of instruction. Its course is much more unitary, and the different school subjects interact in contributing to it. While the processes of instruction follow their own logical order, they awaken and direct a system of processes in the child's mind which is hidden from direct observation and subject to its own developmental laws. To uncover these developmental processes stimulated by instruction is one of the basic tasks of the psychological study of learning. Specifically, our experiments brought out, of, brought out the following interrelated facts. The psychological prerequisites for instruction in different school subjects are to a large extent the same. Instruction in a given subject influences the development of the higher functions far beyond the confines of that particular subject. The main psychic functions involved in studying various subjects are interdependent. 
Their common bases are consciousness and deliberate mastery, the principal contributions of the school years. It follows from these findings that all the basic school subjects act, act as formal discipline, each facilitating the learning of the others. The psychological functions stimulated by them develop in one complex process. Number four. In the fourth series of studies, we attacked a problem which has not received sufficient attention in the past, but which we consider of focal importance for the study of learning and development. Most of the psychological investigations concerned with school learning measured the level of mental development of the child by making him solve certain standardized problems. The problems he was able to solve by himself were supposed to indicate the level of his mental development at the particular time. But in this way, only the completed part of the child's development can be measured, which is far from the whole story. We tried a different approach. Having found that the mental age of two children was, let us say, eight, we gave each of them harder problems than he could manage on his own and provided some slight assistance, the first step in a solution, a leading question, or some other form of help. We discovered that one child could, in cooperation, solve problems designed for 12-year-olds, while the other could not go beyond problems intended for nine-year-olds. The discrepancy between a child's actual mental age and the level he reaches in solving problems with assistance indicates the zone of his proximal development. In our, de in our example, this zone is four for the first child and one for the second. Can we truly say that their mental development is the same? Experience has shown that the child with the larger zone of proximal development will do much better in school. This measure gives a more helpful clue than mental age does to the dynamics of intellectual progress. Psychologists today cannot share the layman's belief that imitation is a mechanical activity and that anyone can imitate almost anything if shown how. To imitate, it is necessary to possess the means of stepping from something one knows to something new. With assistance, every child can do more than he can by himself, though only within the limits set by the state of his development. Kohler found that a chimpanzee can imitate only those intelligent acts of other apes that he could have performed on his own. Persistent training, it is true, can induce him to perform much more complicated actions, but these are carried out mechanically and have all the earmarks of meaningless habits rather than of insightful solutions. The cleverest animal is incapable of intellectual development through imitation. It can be drilled to perform specific act, acts, but the new habits do not result in new general abilities. In this sense, it can be said that animals are unteachable. In the child's development, on the contrary, imitation and instruction play a major role. They bring out the specifically human qualities of the mind and lead the child to new developmental levels. In learning to speak, as in learning school subjects, imitation is indispensable. What the child can do in cooperation today, he can do alone tomorrow. Therefore, the only good kind of instruction is that which marches ahead of development and leads it. It must be aimed not so much at the ripe as at the ripening functions. It remains necessary to determine the lowest threshold at which instruction in, say, arithmetic may begin since a certain minimal ripeness of functions is required. But we must consider the upper threshold as well. Instruction must be oriented towards the future, not the past. For a time, our schools favored the complex system of instruction, which was believed to be adapted to the child's ways of thinking. In offering the child problems he was able to handle without help, this method failed to utilize the zone of proximal development and to lead the child to what he could not yet do. Instruction was oriented to the child's weakness rather than his strength thus encouraging him to remain at the preschool stage of development. For each subject of instruction, there is a period when its influence is most fruitful because the child is most receptive to it. It has been called the sensitive period by Montessori and other educators. The term is used also in biology for the periods in ontogenetic development when the organism is particularly responsive to influences of certain kinds. During that period, an influence that has little effect earlier or later may radically affect the course of development. But the existence of an opti optimum time for instruction in a given subject cannot be explained in purely biological terms. 
at least not for such complex processes as written speech. Our investigation demonstrated the social and cultural nature of the development of the higher functions during these periods, i.e., it's dependent on cooperation with adults and on instruction. Montessori's data, however, retain their significance. She found, for instance, that if a child is taught to write early at four and a half or five years of age, he responds by explosive writing, an abundant and imaginative use of written speech that is never duplicated by children a few years older. This is a striking example of the strong influence that instruction can have when the corresponding functions have not yet fully matured. The existence of sensitive periods for all subjects of instruction is fully supported by the data of our studies. The school years as a whole are the optimum period for instruction in operations that require awareness and deliberate control. Instruction in these operations maximally furthers the development of the higher psychological functions while they are maturing. This applies also to the development of the scientific concepts to which school instruction introduces the child. Part 4. Z. E. Schiff, under our guidance, conducted an investigation of the development of scientific and everyday concepts during school age. Its chief purpose was to test experimentally our working hypothesis of the development of scientific concepts compared with everyday concepts. The child was given structurally similar problems dealing with either scientific or ordinary material, and his solutions were compared. The experiments included making up stories from series of pictures that showed the beginning of an action, its continuation and its end, and completing fragments of sentences ending in because or although. These tests were completed by clinical discussion. The material for one series of tests was taken from social science courses of the second and fourth grades. The second series used simple situations of everyday life, such as the boy went to the movies because... The girl cannot yet read, although he fell off his bicycle because. Supplementary methods of study included testing the extent of the child's knowledge and observation during lessons specially organized for the purpose. The children we studied were primary school pupils. Analysis of the data compared separately for each age group in the table below shows that as long as the curriculum supplies the necessary material, the development of scientific concepts runs ahead of the development of spontaneous concepts. Table. Correct completions of sentence fragments. Second grade, fourth grade, in percentages. Fragments ending in because. Scientific concepts. In second grade, 79.7%. In fourth grade, 81.8%. Fragments ending in because. Spontaneous concepts. For second grade, 59%. For fourth grade, 81.3%. Fragments ending in although. Scientific concepts. For second grade, 21.3%. For fourth grade, 79.5%. Spontaneous concepts in fragments ending in although. 16.2% for second grade and 65.5% for fourth grade. How are we to explain the fact that problems involving scientific concepts are solved correctly more often than similar problems involving everyday concepts? We can at once dismiss the notion that the child is helped by factual information acquired at school and lacks experience in everyday matters. Our tests, like Piaget's, dealt entirely with things and relations familiar to the child and often spontaneously mentioned by him in conversation. No one would assume that a child knows less about bicycles, children, or school than about the class struggle, exploitation, or the Paris Commune. The advantage of familiarity is all on the side of the everyday concepts. The child must find it hard to solve problems involving life situations because he lacks awareness of his concepts and therefore cannot operate with them at will as the task demands. A child of eight or nine uses because correctly in spontaneous conversation. He would never say that a boy fell and broke his leg because he was taken to the hospital. Yet that is the sort of thing he comes up with in experiments until the concept because becomes fully conscious. On the other hand, he correctly finishes sentences on social science subjects. Planned economy is possible in the USSR because there is no private property. All land, factories, and plants belong to the workers and peasants. 
Why is he capable of performing the operation in this case? Because the teacher, working with the pupil, has explained, supplied information, questioned, corrected, and made the pupil explain. The child's concepts have been formed in the process of instruction, in collaboration with an adult. In finishing the sentence, he makes use of the fruits of that collaboration, this time independently. The adult's help, invisibly present, enables the child to solve such problems earlier than everyday problems. At the same age level, second grade, all those sentences present a different picture. Scientific concepts are not ahead of everyday ones. We know that adversative relations appear later than causal relations in the child's spontaneous thinking. A child of that age can learn to use because consciously because by then he has already mastered its spontaneous use. Not having mastered although, in the same way, he naturally cannot use it deliberately in his scientific thinking. Hence, the percentage of successes is equally low in both test series. Our data show quick progress in the solution of problems involving everyday concepts. In the fourth grade, because fragments are completed correctly with equal frequency for everyday and for scientific material. This bears out our assumption that mastering a higher level in the realm of scientific concepts also raises the level of spontaneous concepts. Once the child has achieved consciousness and control in one kind of concepts, all of the previously formed concepts are reconstructed accordingly. The relationship between scientific and spontaneous concepts in the adversative category presents in the fourth grade a picture very similar to that of the causal category in the second grade. The percentage of correct solutions for tasks involving scientific concepts surpasses the percentage for those involving everyday concepts. If the dynamics are the same for both categories, everyday concepts may be expected to rise sharply in the next stage of development and finally to catch up with scientific concepts. Starting two years later, the whole process of the development of although would duplicate that of because. We believe that our data warrant the assumption that from the very beginning the child's scientific and his spontaneous concepts for instance, exploitation and brother, develop in reverse directions. Starting far apart, they move to meet each other. This is the key point of our hypothesis. The child becomes conscious of his spontaneous concepts relatively late. The ability to define them in words, to operate with them at will, appears long after he has acquired the concepts. He has the concept, i.e., knows the object to which the concept refers, but is not conscious of his own act of thought. The development of a scientific concept, on the other hand, usually begins with its verbal definition and its use in non-spontaneous operations, with working on the concept itself. It starts its life in the child's mind at the level that his spontaneous concepts reach only later. A child's everyday concept, such as brother, is saturated with experience, yet when he is asked to solve an abstract problem about a brother's brother, as in Piaget's experiments, he becomes confused. On the other hand, though he can correctly answer questions about slavery, exploitation, or civil war, these concepts are schematic and lack the rich content derived from personal experience. They are filled in gradually in the course of further schoolwork and reading. One might say that the development of the child's spontaneous concepts proceeds upward, and the development of his scientific concepts downward to a more elementary and concrete level. This is a consequence of the different ways in which the two kinds of concepts emerge. The inception of a spontaneous concept can usually be traced to a face-to-face -face meeting with a concrete situation. A scientific concept involves from the first a mediated attitude toward its object. Though scientific and spontaneous concepts develop in reverse directions, the two processes are closely connected. The development of a spontaneous concept must have reached a certain level for the child to be able to absorb a related scientific concept. For example, historical concepts can begin to develop only when the child's everyday concept of the past is sufficiently differentiated, when his own life and the life of those around him can be fitted into the elementary generalization in the past and now. His geographic and sociological concepts must grow out of the simple schema here and elsewhere. In working its slow way upward, an everyday concept clears a path for the scientific concept and its downward development. 
It creates a series of structures necessary for the evolution of a concept's more primitive elementary aspects, which give it body and vitality. Scientific concepts, in turn, supply structures for the upward development of the child's spontaneous concepts toward consciousness and deliberate use. Scientific concepts grow down through spontaneous concepts. Spontaneous concepts grow up, upward, through scientific concepts. The influence of scientific concepts on the mental development of the child is analogous to the effect of learning a foreign language, a process which is conscious and deliberate from the start. In one's native language, the primitive aspects of speech are acquired before the more complex ones. The latter presuppose some awareness of phonetic, grammatical, and syntactic forms. With a foreign language, the higher forms develop before spontaneous fluent speech. The intellectualistic theories of language, such as Stern's, which place a full grasp of the relationship between sign and meaning at the very beginning of linguistic development, contain a measure of truth in the case of a foreign language. The child's strong points in a foreign language are his weak points in his native language, and vice versa. In his own language, the child conjugates and declines correctly, but without realizing it. He cannot tell the gender, the case, or the tense of the word he is using. In a foreign language, he distinguishes between masculine and feminine gender and is, is conscious of grammatical forms from the beginning. Of phonetics, the same is true. Faultlessly articulating his native speech, the child is unconscious of the sounds he pronounces, and in learning to spell, he has great difficulty in dividing a word into its constituent sounds. In a foreign language, he does this easily, and his writing does not lag behind his speech. It is the pronunciation, the spontaneous phonetics, that he finds hard to master. Easy, spontaneous speech with a quick and sure command of grammatical structures comes to him only as the crowning achievement of long, arduous study. Success in learning a foreign language is contingent on a certain degree of maturity in the native language. The child can transfer to the new language the system of meanings he already possesses in his own. The reverse is also true. A foreign language facilitates mastering the higher forms of the native language. The child learns to see his language as one particular system among many, to view its phenomena under more general categories, and this leads to awareness of his linguistic operations. Goethe said with truth that he who knows no foreign language does not truly know his own. It is not surprising that an analogy should exist between the interaction of the native and the foreign language and the interaction of scientific and spontaneous concepts, since both processes belong in the sphere of developing verbal thought. However, there are also essential differences between them. In foreign language study, attention centers on the exterior, sonal, physical aspects of verbal thought, in the development of scientific concepts on its semantic aspect. The two developmental processes follow separate, though similar, paths. Nevertheless, both suggest a single answer to the question of how new systems are formed that are structurally analogous to earlier ones. Written speech, foreign language, verbal thought in general, the experimental evidence yielded by our studies disproves the theory of shift, or displacement, which states that the later stage repeats the course of the earlier one, including the recurrence of difficulties already overcome on the, on the lower plane. All our evidence supports the hypothesis that analogous systems develop in reverse directions at the higher and at the lower levels, each system influencing the other and benefiting from the strong points of the other. We can now turn to the interrelation of concepts in a system, the focal problem of our analysis. Concepts do not lie in the child's mind like peas in a bag, without any bonds between them. If that were the case, no intellectual operation requiring coordination of thoughts would be possible, nor any general conception of the world. Not even separate concepts as such could exist. Their very nature presupposes a system. The study of the child's concepts at, at each age level shows that the degree of generality, plant, flower, rose, is the basic psychological variable according to which they can be meaningfully ordered. If every concept is a generalization, then the relationship between concepts is a relationship of generality. 
The logical aspect of that relationship has been studied much more fully than its genetic and psychological aspects. Our study attempts to fill this gap. We compared the degree of generality of the child's real concepts with the phases and stages reached by the child in experimental concept formation, syncretism, complex, preconcept, and concept. Our aim was to find out whether a definite relationship existed between the structure of generalization typified by these phases and the degree of generality of concepts. Concepts of differing degrees of generality may occur in one and the same generalizational structure. For instance, the ideas flower and rose may both be present at the stage of complex thinking. Correspondingly, Concepts of equal generality may appear within different structures of generalization, e.g., flower, may apply to any and all flowers at the complex stage, as well as in conceptual thinking. We found, however, that in spite of this lack of complete correspondence, each phase or generalizational structure has as its counterpart a specific level of generality, a specific relationship of superordinate and subordinate concepts, a typical combination of the concrete and the abstract. The term flower, it is true, may be equally general at the level of complex and of concept, but only in relation to the objects to which it refers. Equal generality here does not imply identity of all the psychological processes involved in the use of this term. Thus, in complex thinking, the relationship of flower to rose is not superordination. The wider and the narrower concepts coexist on the same plane. In our experiments, a mute child learned without much difficulty the words table, chair, bureau, couch, shelves, and so on. The term furniture, however, proved too hard to grasp. The same child, having successfully learned shirt, hat, coat, pants, etc., could not rise above the level of this series and master clothes. We found that at a certain level of development, the child is incapable of moving vertically from one word meaning to another, i.e., of understanding their relationships of generality. All his concepts are on one level, refer directly to objects, and are delimited from one another in the same way that the objects themselves are delimited. Verbal thought is no more than a dependent component of perceptual, object-determined thought. Hence, this stage must be considered an early presyncretic stage in the development of word meaning. The appearance of the first generalized concept, such as furniture or clothes, is as significant a symptom of progress as the first meaningful word. The higher levels in the development of word meanings are governed by the law of equivalence of concepts, according to which any concept can be formulated in terms of other concepts in a countless number of ways. We shall illustrate the schema underlying this law by an analogy not ideally accurate, but close enough to serve the purpose. If we imagine that the totality of concepts is distributed over the surface of a globe, the location of every concept may be defined by means of a system of coordinates corresponding to longitude and latitude in geography. One of these coordinates will indicate the location of a concept between the extremes of maximally generalized abstract conceptualization and the immediate sensory grasp of an object, i.e., its degree of concreteness and abstraction. The second coordinate will represent the objective reference of the concept, the locus within reality to which it applies. Two concepts applying to different areas of reality but comparable in degree of abstractness, e.g., plants and animals, could be conceived of as varying in latitude but having the same longitude. The geographical analogy breaks down in several details. The more generalized concept, for instance, applies to a broader area of content, which should be represented by a line, not a point. But it serves to convey the idea that to be adequately characterized, each concept must be placed within two continua, one that represents objective content and another that represents acts of thought apprehending the content. Their intersection determines all the relationships of the given concept to others, its coordinate, superordinate and subordinate concepts. This position of a concept within the total system of concepts may be called its measure of generality. The manifold mutual relations of concepts on which the law of equivalence is based are determined by their respective measures of generality. 
Let us take two extreme examples, the child's early presyncretic words lacking any variation in degree of generality and the concepts of numbers developed through the study of arithmetic. In the first case, obviously every concept can be expressed only through itself, never through other concepts. In the second case, any number may be expressed in countless ways because of the infinity of numbers and because the concept of any number contains also all of its relationships to all other numbers. One, for instance, may be expressed as 1000 minus 999, or in general, as the difference between any two consecutive numbers, or as any number divided by itself, and in a myriad of other ways. This is a pure example of equivalence of concepts. Insofar as equivalence depends on the relationships of generality between concepts, and these are specific for every generalizational structure, the latter determines the equivalence of concepts possible within its sphere. The measure of generality determines not only the equivalence of concepts, but also all of the intellectual operations possible with a given concept. All intellectual operations, comparisons, judgments, conclusions, require some movement within the net of coordinates we have outlined. Developmental changes in the structure of generalization cause changes also in these operations. For example, as higher levels of generality and equivalence of concepts are reached, it becomes easier for a child to remember thoughts independently of words. A young child must reproduce the exact words in which a meaning was conveyed to him. A school child can already render a relatively complex meaning in his own words. Thus, his intellectual freedom increases. In pathological disturbances of conceptual thinking, the measure of generality of concepts is distorted. The balance between the abstract and the concrete is upset, and the relationship to other concepts becomes unstable. The mental act, through which both the object and the object's relation to the concept are grasped, loses its unity and thought begins to run along broken, capricious, illogical lines. One goal of our study of the child's real concepts was to find reliable indices of their structure of generalization. Only with their help could the genetic schema yielded by our experimental studies of artificial concepts be profitably applied to the child's developing real concepts. Such an index was finally discovered in the concept's measure of generality which varies on the different levels of development from syncretic formations to concepts proper. Analysis of the child's real concepts also helped us to determine how concepts differ at the various levels in their relationship to the object and to word meaning, and in the intellectual operations they make possible. Furthermore, the investigation of real concepts complemented the experimental study by making it clear that every new stage in the development of generalization is built on generalizations of the preceding level. The products of the intellectual activity of the earlier phases are not lost. The inner bond between the consecutive phases could not be uncovered in our experiments because the subject had to discard after each wrong solution the generalizations he had formed and start all over again. Also, the nature of the experimental objects did not permit their conceptualization in hierarchical terms. The investigation of real concepts filled these gaps. The preschoolers' ideas, which have the structure of complexes, were found to result not from grouping images of individual objects, but from elaboration of generalizations predominant during an earlier phase. At a higher level, we found an analogous relationship between old and new formations in the development of arithmetical and algebraic concepts. The rise from preconcepts, which the schoolchild's arithmetical concepts usually are, to true concepts, such as the algebraic concepts of adolescence, is achieved by generalizing the generalizations of the earlier level. At the earlier stage, certain aspects of objects had been abstracted and generalized into ideas of numbers. Algebraic concepts represent abstractions and generalizations of certain aspects of numbers, not objects, and thus signify a new departure, a new higher plane of thought. The new higher concepts in turn transform the meaning of the lower. The adolescent who has mastered algebraic concepts has gained a vantage point from which he sees arithmetical concepts in a broader perspective. We saw this especially clearly in experimenting with shifts 
from the decimal to other numerical systems. As long as the child operates with the decimal system without having become conscious of it as such, he has not mastered the system but is, on the contrary, bound by it. When he becomes able to view it as a particular instance of the wider concept of a scale of notation, he can operate deliberately with this or any other numerical system. The ability to shift at will from one system to another, e.g. to translate from the decimal system into one that is based on five, is the criterion of this new level of consciousness, since it indicates the existence of a general concept of a system of numeration. In this, as in other instances of passing from one level of meaning to the next, the child does not have to restructure separately all of his earlier concepts, which indeed would be a Sisyphean labor. Once a new structure has been incorporated into his thinking, usually through concepts recently acquired in school, it gradually spreads to the older concepts as they are drawn into the intellectual operations of the higher type. Our investigation of children's real concepts throws a new light on another important issue in the theory of thought. The Würzburg School demonstrated that the course of directed thought is not governed by associative connections, but it did little to clarify the specific factors that actually determine this course. Gestalt psychology substituted the principle of structure for that of association, but failed to distinguish thought proper from perception, memory, and all the other functions subject to structural laws. It repeated the pattern of the association theory in reducing all the functions to one level. Our investigations help to transcend this pattern by showing that thought of a higher level is governed by the relations of generality between concepts, a system of relations absent from perception and memory. Bertheimer has demonstrated that productive thinking is contingent on transferring the problem from the structure within which it was first apprehended to an entirely different context or structure. But to transfer an object of thought from structure A to structure B, one must transcend the given structural bonds, and this, as our studies show, requires shifting to a plane of greater generality, to a concept subsuming and governing both A and B. We can now reaffirm on a sound basis of data that the absence of a system is the cardinal psychological difference distinguishing spontaneous from scientific concepts. It could be shown that all the peculiarities of the child thought described by Piaget, such as syncretism, juxtaposition, insensitivity to contradiction, stem from the absence of a system in the child's spontaneous concepts, a consequence of undeveloped relations of generality. For example, to be disturbed by a contradiction the child would have to view the contradictory statements in the light of some general principle, i.e., within a system. But when a child in Piaget's experiments says of one object that it dissolved in water because it was small, and of another that it dissolved because it was big, he merely makes empirical statements of facts which follow the logic of perceptions. No generalization of the kind smallness leads to dissolution is present in his mind, and hence the two statements are not felt to be contradictory. It is this lack of distance from the immediate experience and not syncretism viewed as a compromise between the logic of dreams and reality that accounts for the peculiarities of child thought. Therefore, these peculiarities do not appear in the child's scientific concepts, which from their very inception carry within them relationships of generality, i.e. some rudiments of a system. The formal discipline of scientific concepts gradually transforms the structure of the child's spontaneous concepts and helps organize them into a system. This furthers the child's ascent to higher developmental levels. Our disagreement with Piaget centers on one point only, but an important point. He assumes that development and instruction are entirely separate, incommensurate processes, that the function of instruction is merely to introduce adult ways of thinking which conflict with the child's own and eventually supplant them. Studying child thought apart from the influence of instruction, as Piaget did, excludes a very important source of change and bars the researcher from posing the question of the interaction of development and instruction peculiar to each age level. Our own approach focuses on this interaction. Having found many complex inner ties between spontaneous and scientific concepts, 
We hope that future comparative investigations will further clarify their interdependence, and we anticipate an extension of the study of development and instruction to lower age levels. Instruction, after all, does not begin in school. A future investigator may well find that the child's spontaneous concepts are a product of preschool instruction, just as scientific concepts are a product of school instruction. Part 5. Apart from theoretical conclusions, our comparative study of scientific and everyday concepts yielded some important methodological results. The methods we worked out for use in this study permit us to bridge the gap between the investigations of experimental and of real concepts. The information gathered on the mental processes of the school child studying social science, schematic and rudimentary as it is, has suggested some possible improvements in the teaching of that subject. In retrospect, we are aware of some omissions and of some methodological defects, perhaps inevitable in a first approach to a new field. We did not study experimentally and in detail the nature of the school child's everyday concepts. This leaves us without the data needed to describe the total course of psychological development during school age. Hence, our criticism of Piaget's basic theses is insufficiently buttressed by reliable, systematically obtained facts. The study of scientific concepts was conducted in one category only, social science concepts, and the particular concepts selected for study do not form or suggest a system inherent in the logic, in the logic of the subject. While we learned a good deal about the development of scientific compared with spontaneous concepts, we learned little about the regularity specific to the development of sociological concepts as such. Future studies should include concepts from various fields of school instruction, each set matched against a set of everyday concepts drawn from a similar area of ex experience. Last but not least, the conceptual structures that we studied were not sufficiently differentiated. For example, in using sentence fragments ending in because, we did not separate the various types of causal relations, empirical, psychological, logical, as Piaget did in his studies. Had we done that, we might have been able to make a finer differentiation between the test performance of school children of different ages. These very flaws, however, help in mapping the course of future investigations. The present study is merely a first, very modest step in exploring a new and highly promising area in the psychology of child thought.